everyone. Uh, welcome to the first session on today's agenda, uh, where, as Tim mentions, we'll be speaking about um, the, the very topical um, and relevant subject of climate change and decarbonisation um, and seizing the opportunity. Um, so as Tim mentioned, um, my name's Julie Vasadi. I lead KPMG's ESG transaction services practice. Um, and we have a group of dedicated ESG deals um, practitioners who specialise in identifying and quantifying ESG risks and also climate risk as well as value creation opportunities across each stage of the investment life cycle. Um, so I might get each of the panellists now to introduce themselves. Edwina, can we kick off with you? Uh, Edwina Matthew, I'm an Investment Director in Sustainable Investments at Wellington um, Management. I, uh, support investors across the APAC region in you know, all things ESG and SI related, including you know, their um, assessment of climate risks and opportunities, as well as working with our client group, um, as well as the LPs, um, and also we, you know, working with our broader SI, dedicated uh, sustainable investing in ESG uh, platforms across both our private and public markets teams. Hi, Natasha Morris. I'm a Managing Director of Responsibility and Impact at Adamantum Capital. For those of you that don't know us, we are an Australian GP focused in the mid-markets. Uh, relevantly for today's conversation, we run two private equity strategies, a traditional buyout strategy, but that has a very strong responsible investing focus um, integrated into its investment thesis. And so we've done a lot of work on climate change and decarbonisation across our portfolio as part of that approach. And I'll talk a bit more about that later today. And we also run an environment an environmental opportunities strategy, which is a line, it's a private equity strategy, but aligned to the decarbonisation and net zero thematic. Hi, my name is Carl Prince. I'm uh, formerly from the industry, working in uh, hedge funds and venture capital um, for seven years before switching to sustainability. And about just over three years ago, we founded a company called Path Zero uh, that has a mission to bring transparency to carbon emissions between asset owners, asset managers, and the portfolio companies that, that you invest in uh, to enable a lot of the climate risk management uh, required in a, in a modern portfolio. Hi, hi all, pleasure to be here today. Suzanne Tavel, I'm a partner at Stepstone Group, and I lead the firm's efforts globally around ESG and impact investing. And specifically with regard to the latter, this is where we will work with clients either on a bespoke basis to create programs for them um, to address decarbonisation or specific themes within that, like energy transition, or also give our clients opportunities to access our commingled uh, Step Zone Climate Fund, which is a private equity focused vehicle. Beautiful. Thank you, everyone. Um, so if I could just take a few moments now to um, provide some context and really to set the scene for today's discussion. Um, as, as many of you would be aware, climate change is now considered to be, by many, um, as one of the greatest um, threats to our economic stability. Um, extreme weather events um, as a result of climate change is expected to cost between two and four billion dollars um, per year by 2030. Um, and considering the urgency, there's a record number of countries and companies um, that have pledged commitment to carbon neutrality or, or net zero by 2050 in response. Um, so certainly large investment opportunities exist um, with the unprecedented amounts of capital that will be required to decarbonise the planet. Um, and for us to stay on track um, to meet our 1.5 degree warming goal aligned to the Paris Agreement, um, it will require $4.3 trillion of annual investment into energy transition and decarbonisation initiatives. The current level of um, investment is $1.4 trillion annually, so that represents, for those that enjoy numbers, a $2.9 trillion um, investment gap annually um, across the, the course of the next three decades. Um, and so we're, we're seeing record inflows of investment uh, and an influx of investors. Um, a, a few more stats. Since 2010, $120 billion uh, of investment has gone into decarbonisation startups, with $35 billion of that being deployed um, alone in 2021. Um, and that was across more than 900 companies. 
the issuance of green bonds um, exceeded f the $500 billion mark in 2021 as well, which is the highest level ever um, achieved since their inception in 2008. Total climate finance uh, reached $632 billion in 2010, 2020 rather. Um, and apart from the equity and, and debt investors, we're seeing some of the largest corporations on the planet um, setting aside billions of dollars for investment in uh, decarbonisation and energy transition. Um, new asset classes as well are, are increasingly competing for investment allocations. Um, some of those examples include alternative alternative energy, energy transition, advanced materials, preservation, preservation and environmental markets. Um, the average size of early stage low carbon tech deals has grown approximately five times since 2010. Um, big ticket size deals as well, so greater than $100 million of funding are now increasingly common and the space now very impressively boasts 47 unicorns. Um, so with, with that context, with the scale of the challenge and the urgency, climate change is perhaps the largest investment opportunity of this century. And with that context, I'd like to now uh, throw the discussion open to the panel. Um, Tash, if I could start with you. Um, where are you seeing the investment opportunities in decarbonisation? Um, which sectors are most conducive to investment? And what opportunities exist in, in those sectors and assets that aren't thematically aligned necessarily to decarb? Thanks, Julie. Um, I think you, you've heard from Julie's introduction there the lots of unfathomable trillions numbers um, that get thrown around in this space. Um, and I think we're seeing an enormous a lot of investment opportunities in the decarbonisation and closely aligned thematics. And I think those of you in the room that have been looking at that space will know that it is changing very, very rapidly um, at the moment. We've definitely seen that being led out of some of the overseas jurisdictions um, and the, the rise of climate funds um, and the amount of climate focused funds that are being raised internationally would suggest that others are seeing the same opportunities. But we think there are real opportunities in the Australian market as well. Um, historically, as you would know, we haven't had the strong policy environment that um, really unlocks some of that private capital in Australia, that is changing. We now have a national policy commitment to decarbonise um, and there's a lot of work going on behind the scenes um, to really strengthen that policy environment in recognition of the need for capital inflow into Australia for decarbonisation. I think the way we look at it as private equity investors um, is we see that there's a lot of opportunities in the private equity space um, for investment in this thematic. So a lot of those trillion numbers that Julie mentioned before, there's clearly huge opportunities at the infrastructure end of the spectrum for investment. Um, and that's where a lot of those large numbers come from. Um, equally, at the other end of the spectrum, there is an absolute need for VC style investments in new and emerging technologies that are going to be required to facilitate decarbonisation. But from our experience, we've, we've worked across our portfolio to develop net zero pathways for all of our portfolio companies. Our portfolio companies sit across a range of industries and sectors in Australia and New Zealand, and they are all facing the same challenges. And there is, they all need these support and operating businesses that sit around the decarbonisation activities that are required need to massively scale and grow in the next three, five, 10 years to facilitate decarbonisation. And that's where traditional private equity toolkit in terms of investing, even though it's thematically aligned, can help that to happen. So we don't look at the investment opportunity. So, so we think there's a real opportunity in that asset class. Um, we don't look so much at the opportunity on an industry or sectoral basis. We think it's quite thematic and there are a number of industries and sectors that play into those themes. Um, so the way we look at it is there's a massive opportunity in clean energy and electrification. Um, and so that, that's where there'll be, a, and we're seeing a lot of pipeline opportunities in that space. We've seen it in our portfolio companies. So from our industrial laundries business that relies on on gas for process heat to our aged care business in New Zealand that relies on gas to heat its residents' homes. Um, the electrification of, of that kind of um, process heat and heating is a real challenge and there are not the businesses out there that can roll that out at a scale in Australia yet. And so there's a lot of opportunities to invest in the operating businesses that sit around that. The second thematic we look at is natural capital. 
So, and that's where I'm talking carbon sequestration. I'm talking biodiversity related style investments. Um, and again, we invested in a business called Climate Friendly on the buyout side of our um, investment strategy a couple of years ago. They're a carbon project development company. We recently exited part of a stake in that business. It's been a really good investment and it's a really strong demonstration of the, the, the ability to generate strong ret financial returns in this space. And then the third thematic we're seeing, which is a little bit to the last point in your question, Julie, is the circular economy. Um, you don't necessarily think of that as part of decarbonisation or the net zero thematic, but it's absolutely related to that, to that theme. And there are enormous opportunities in circular economy. And again, we're seeing that particularly across our consumer products focused businesses in our portfolio. So we've seen that firsthand across our portfolio where those investment opportunities lie. Um, I think equally, we're seeing a really strong um, demand and pool of capital from LPs that are very interested in investing in this space. And so I think the matching of those investment opportunities in Australia with, with the demand um, is something that you're going to see a lot more investment in this space, particularly in the private equity um, part of the market moving forward. Fantastic. Thank you, Tash. Um, Suzanne, could you give us some insights from a global perspective on um, fundraising across PE and how it really cascades down to different sectors and um, thematics? Sure. So just focusing on private equity and including venture. So at the moment, there's about 900 funds in market that we would classify as being climate funds. This is probably up from about 500 last year. So the rate of increase is substantial and it's a sharp cliff when you, you look back compared to a number of years ago. Um, so currently of that 900, at least 400 are, are raising today. If we look at how that cuts into size, um, about 10% of those are raising above a billion. So that starts to also give you indication that um, from a um, sort of strategy perspective, uh, an important component from an AUM perspective, but actually smaller in terms of size, is the buyout strategy within the space. We, we see about half of the strategies that we're looking at falling into the venture and growth um, style across climate. And so when we step back, it's probably, it's actually, it's, it, 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 it's a good deal over half. So when you step back, that makes complete sense, right? Because as you've heard, we're really, uh, frankly, at the early innings of trying to decarbonize an entire global economy. And a lot of the uh, businesses, the services that are needed to achieve this end, they are in fact being spawned within the venture and still grown in the growth space today. Um, those platforms have yet to reach the scale to be ready for, for buyout. So I think the picture will start to change over the next um, sort of five years or so as things are moving, moving quite rapidly. Out of all of those funds, perhaps the largest component is, as Tash was alluding to, are dedicated around energy transition. And here, energy transition, I would encourage you to not just think about renewables, but think about um, really the entire change of our, uh, of our economy towards a much more electric-based economy. Um, so that's going to touch all mobility sectors, think about the property sector as well. And that's what makes it such an enormous opportunity there. Um, the food space, um, agriculture, natural capital um, is then, and, and we would actually include thinking about waste, recycling, water, all as part of that, that becomes the next sort of biggest opportunity that we see. So reimagining our entire food system, food to waste, um, and, and water. And then finally, one of the other areas that we see as growing, but still smaller than the other two opportunities um, from a thematic sense, is what we term, borrowed from the Europeans, just transition. So really businesses that we think are looking to address the social side of what's going to happen out of climate change, because unfortunately the social inequality that's going to drive as a result of climate change is going to be extremely severe. So it's businesses, and here you can think about in the education, in the financial space, that are looking to address that opportunity. Fantastic. Thank you, Suzanne. Edwina, 
Where do you see the risks and opportunities? Um, and in terms of kind of overlaps or differences to what we've heard today already from Tash and Suzanne, can you give us some, a sense? Thanks, Julie. Um, yeah, I think we've covered a lot of territory already, so I'll try and sort of, I guess, shine the spotlight on sort of some areas that might not have been covered yet. Um, to us, when we think about investing in climate-related opportunities, yes, it comes through some of the dedicated, you know, climate uh, strategies that we run, um, and you know, we've that's on the public markets as well as the private markets. Uh, and there's a lot of learnings that we have. You know, we launched um, you know, similar, a dedicated climate strategy in a private platform last year, but we've been managing public markets uh, climate strategies since 2007. So there's a lot of learnings that we have that we're embedding into how we, how we approach a lot of these themes that you know, we've had coming out of clean tech 1.0 to the way we are today. And you know, to the point, I think, that, that both Tash and Suzanne have made, it's not about a particular sector. To us, you know, climate change is an existential challenge that we're facing. It's touching all sectors of the economy. So in terms of how we're, we approach it, it's really about d going deep in sub-slices of sectors and then aligning the, you know, the skills and the expertise to that. So yes, you know, we have the energy. We also have you know, buildings and cities themes. Um, we have um, you know, industry and enterprise. Food and ag is, is another one, um, and then also transportation and, and mobility. And we see opportunities across all of those, those themes. Um, another area where I think you know, it's important to also acknowledge is, yes, you can sort of think about it in terms of you know, what are some of the thematic um, you know, ways you can tap into the thematics in terms of investment opportunities, but also the, the bottom-up ESG integration. You know, just because you know, a company sc screens green doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be, from an operational perspective, it's going to be managing its risks. And you know, to Suzanne's point, it's not just environmental risks in terms of decarbonisation, it's also you know, social and governance risks as well. And so the investment opportunities Opportunities, you know, really do come through both that sort of thematic top down as well as the bottom up. Um, the other point I'd say is that um, increasingly, you know, the reality is we're not decarbonising fast enough. And we're seeing it every day in terms of, you know, real um, world impacts um, coming through on the physical side, you know, floods, bushfires, you know, drought, etc. And so for us, we cut across each of our sub-slices, both in terms of what are the opportunities in decarbonisation and you know, climate mitigation, but also what are the opportunities uh, when it comes to adaptation. And you know, we're not talking here about building seawalls. This is about sort of thinking about what companies, how are they you know, enabling and supporting society to adapt to the effects of climate change. Um, it can come through things like um, you know, hurricane impact resistant glass, you know, companies that manufacture that, or through weather analytics companies um, that are helping you know, uh, transportation companies, airlines, et cetera, be a lot more nuanced and recalibrate you know, how they're thinking about short-term weather impacts you know, on, on our operations. Um, when it comes to some of the risks, I think you know, I'll bring it up a, le a level just to sort of highlight you know, when it, managing some of these strategies, what are some of the things that we're facing on the private side. Um, I think you know, too often, you know, it's expanding on that point, is we conflate what is a climate impact and what is you know, ESG integration. Like, wow, well, are we managing the risks and making sure that you don't assume one substitutes the other? We need both. Um, I think the other thing, ESG due, due diligence um, is not box ticking and it's not a set and forget. You know, we, we've de we develop ESG roadmaps for all of our portfolio companies um, and that is about highlighting to them, you know, where are their opportunities to really leverage and raise their profile with, with potential customers um, as well in terms of new business, but also, you know, how can they improve and how do they compare against peers and increasing that we, we can bring in the data from the public side as well. Um, the other one, which I'm sure we'll go into more detail, is on the impact ma management and measurement. This, there's a lot of growing scrutiny around that across our industry, but there are standards and frameworks out there, and the LPs are, from, are across those, they understand them, so it's really important to be clear with, your, with our LPs what is our framework, why a certain company um, will qualify or not under the climate materiality lens, um, so there's no surprises. And then lastly, on regulation, I'm sure we'll go into more detail as well, but um, while the private markets directly might not be facing the same amount of climate-related data and disclosure requirements that we're seeing on the public side, there's the indirect channel that it can come through, and it can come through in terms of publicly listed companies in the value chain of private companies, you know, suppliers, customers. It can also come through, you know, the LPs and GPs, because 
we're being subject to a lot of these climate disclosure requirements at a portfolio level, and that in turn will trickle down in terms of us needing to get the data um, and, and disclosures from, from um, our portfolio companies as well. Fantastic. Thank you, Edwina. And that's a great segue to introduce Carl to the discussion. Um, in, in your experience, Carl, um, do GPs have the right information and data to support their investment decisions? What progress has been made to improve the quality of reporting and data? And, and where do you see the challenges still lie? And if you could perhaps touch on that point that Edwina raises around the distinction between the, the public and the, the private port co context, that'd be great. Yes, thank you. And um, yeah, so in, in public markets, uh, public companies put out disclosure, put out their annual accounts, and so often the, the challenge in obtaining data as an asset manager is, is being able to <clears throat> collate that data into a structured uh, form so you can, you can analyze it and use it, and there are some great service providers that, that do that, but the level of influence over those assets might be quite, quite low. Uh, in order to influence what they're actually uh, doing. Uh, whereas in, in, in private markets, there is both an additional challenge, and that is that the portfolio companies or assets often don't have well-formed well uh, TCFD-aligned risk management of their climate exposures, um, never mind some sort of um, carbon emissions calculations. Um, but, they, but the upside is that as a manager, you generally have a lot more influence over those businesses, um, especially in the private equity side compared to uh, perhaps venture. Um, so there is both a, a challenge there, but also an opportunity. So um, yes, often when it comes to a transaction uh, in, in private uh, equity, it, it may be very difficult to obtain um, that data from the assets. So in answer to the first question, obviously that is a big challenge unless that company is already sort of perhaps pre-IPO or preparing for, for being in the public eye. Um, so it is a big challenge. Um, <laughs> is it getting better? Um, absolutely, there are a lot of um, new frameworks uh, out there that have that the market has converged on. So firstly, greenhouse gas accounting in, in the individual entity is, is now widely used. Um, but also within financial institutions, we have uh, PCAF, the Partnership for Carbon Accounting uh, Financials, which, which has set a methodology that can be consistently used across financial institutions, across all asset classes. Um, internationally, and there's more than $80 trillion uh, under management that is now um, reporting under that particular framework. Um, so what that enables is the ability to set a estimate of the emissions of an asset or a portfolio, uh, but also an associated data quality score, uh, which is then consistently applied across markets. So suddenly, if you're looking across a wide portfolio, you can look at your private equity assets, your private debt, your commercial real estate, and actually be able to um, effectively compare those disclosures. So that's been that's been very very uh, helpful in the industry. Fantastic, thanks, Carl. And in response to that, I think as well in in our diligence procedures, uh, we're certainly seeing that in the private sector there's a you know a, there's a gap in emissions data and and monitoring of those stats. Um, there's some fantastic tools that are really. Um, you know, using scientific procedures around direct measurement that can really assist the private sector in estimating and, and measuring those emissions. Um, so there's lots of lots of tools evolving, uh, and it's evolving rapidly. So um, we might now uh, look at a, a slightly different perspective, um, a, a broader market perspective. Suzanne, if I could ask you now, how are GPs using climate and decarbonisation considerations to drive investment? Um, and what progress are GPs making to drive change through their port codes? Okay, so here what we're really speaking about is not what I was speaking about earlier about specialised strategies that are focused around decarbonisation, but here we're just going to focus on your mainstream private equity VC player and how they're bringing considerations around climate into their toolkit, right? I mean, we know these days um, any GP goes out with a considerable toolkit in terms of value add to their, um, to their underlying assets, portfolio companies, and today climate has got to be part of that toolkit because, um, you know, there is a lot to navigate, as you've heard. Um, and so... You know, generally, 
we were in the early innings, again, um, of GEPs um, developing their own competencies and building capacity around the space. What GPs are finding is often as a first step, they need to consider even doing a carbon footprint of their own shop, right, and their own operations. Um, secondly, they need to engage with their portfolio companies to do carbon footprints of those, because how can you even begin to set a strategy and offer value to your underlying assets is if you don't have any idea, you know, what the baseline is, and you don't have any idea where the key sources of emissions are. So for some businesses, yes, it might be as easy as changing an electricity provider. For others, it might be quite complex in terms of feeding directly into adjusting material parts of their, their supply chain. I think, you know, what, so we're seeing GPs grapple with how to engage on that and how to collect the data, engage with their companies, and do that in a manner that is not going to be so time onerous and distracting, um, you know, to, to the portfolio companies and obviously software like Path Zero and relevant applications are critical in that regard. But, um, the second thing is GPs are having to wrap their heads around TCFD, so the Task Force for Climate Disclosure, which really sets the framework for thinking, particularly at a board level, for how to deal with climate, climate risks. And I think, you know, that's where the industry is at. TCFD focus, carbon footprinting focus. Um, with those when you combine those together, then you can move on to setting targets around reducing emissions and the pathways and the relevant strategies. And as Carl highlighted, there is a myriad of frameworks and there's fortunately convergence around what makes those type of activities better practice. And of course, from a GP's perspective, you don't want to be regarded of greenwashing through any part of this process. So it has to be dealt with with, with rigor. But at this point in time, it is really only very advanced groups that are moving towards that target setting. We frankly see that much more prevalent in infrastructure. Uh, which would make sense, right? Um, and, and so I think, you know, for, for G any GPs in the room, uh, starting now is not too late. And uh, I think, um, but within a year or two, we're going to see definitely substantial progress uh, in, in this regard. Fantastic. Thank you, Suzanne. Tash, back to you. Um, how are you approaching climate and decarbonisation in your investment decisions um, and how are you driving change across your portfolio? And to pick up on Suzanne's point about how are you working with your LPs around reporting and disclosures? Um, thanks, Julie. Um, lots of things to touch on on both what um, Carl and Suzanne have just said in answering that question as well. Um, so a as a GP in our, what, what Suzanne was just saying, in our traditional buyout strategy, so I'm not talking about decarbonisation aligned investments anymore, I'm talking about um, our traditional buyout strategy where we have a responsible investing focus. We've um, been integrating climate risk and decarbonisation angles um, for quite some time now across those businesses. So we started footprint, carbon footprinting our portfolio companies in 2019. And we started integrating climate risk analysis into our investment decision making in 2020. Um, we faced all those challenges that both Carl and Suzanne, and continue to face them, that both Carl and Suzanne have just outlined. Um, we've had companies that have said, what do you mean greenhouse gas emissions? When we asked them four years ago, do you measure them? Um, all the way through to companies um, like our industrial laundries business that we bought that had a great environmental management platform and actually had really great data in that business when we bought it. Um, that's not to mean that we couldn't improve that data. So. Um, Data is a, a super huge challenge, but what I'd like to throw out to the room is it's going to continue to be a big challenge. And if you sit back and wait for perfect data set, you will never do anything. Um, so you need to start with whatever data you've got now and build into your processes how you improve that data. So to give you a practical example, our aged care business in New Zealand, um, they have geographically distributed a lot of aged care villages in New Zealand. And when we went to measure their carbon footprint, they had no system for how we could do that. So the first year we did it, it involved quite a lot of estimation. Now we developed a pretty robust and logical framework for that estimation. We we're very transparent about the fact that it included estimation, but we at least started there. Once we got the data, we said, hang on a minute, 
we don't think this is robust enough to actually drive a decarbonisation strategy off the back of. So instead of doing that, spend the next 12 months improving your data collection and getting a better data set for us to make those decisions on, which they did. It actually materially changed the carbon footprint of that business and materially changed the way we drove decisions about what we were going to do to decarbonise that business off the back of it. So the data quality is important. Um, but equally, it, it's not so much for us. It's not about collecting the data just to report it to investors. Actually, the real challenge in this industry is how do you use that data to make better decisions in the businesses and to create value? Because this is not just about saving the planet. Um, this is actually about creating resilience in those businesses and creating value in those businesses through your decarbonisation strategies. So. We, um, we look at climate risk, both physical and transition risks, in the due diligence stage of our businesses. We, we started that in 2020 not from a disclosure point of view, not from a reporting point of view, but in recognition of the fact that this is a real investment risk and we're not doing our job as an investment manager if we're not considering it in our investment decision making. We developed a process for doing that. I can think of at least two transactions where we haven't proceeded with that transaction, not solely because of the climate risk analysis, but it was definitely one of the top three reasons in those. And I'm not sure that without our climate analysis framework, whether that would have been as front and centre in that investment decision making. Um, we, we then translate that analysis through to the risk management frameworks of the portfolio companies once we own them. So they're managing both their physical and their transition risks during our ownership period. That is challenging. Um, and lots of education and management of senior management teams because, being honest, this is pretty new in the Australian market and senior management teams don't always have the reflexes to do that. So there's a lot of training and support and engagement. We spend a lot of time developing IP and tools to train our senior management teams and boards on how to think about these risks and opportunities. Um, and then on the decarbonisation side, we've worked with all of our portfolio companies to develop net zero plans um, within the first year of our ownership. Again, that's challenging. What we're really starting to see, and back to a data point, I think there's a different data set challenge here as well, not just in relation to collecting emissions, but in understanding how um, decarbonising your business is creating value. And we're seeing that across our portfolio company, so our industrial linen services business. The fact that it has a net zero plan is fundamentally important in its conversations with its customers who are seeking to have green suppliers in their supply chains. They have a lot of government customers. So the fact that they have that net zero plan factors front and centre into their discussions with their customers, front is, factors straight into the, into the top line of that business over time. Trying to actually monetize that and quantify that is a data challenge that the business needs to, um, needs to solve. We're seeing it on the cost side. Our high gain business, um, it's a horse feed manufacturing business, installed solar panels as part of its decarbonisation strategy on the top of all its factories. That has a very short payback period and in fact is reducing the cost base of that business through the installation of solar panels. So again, you can see the value connection there. Other businesses, it's had an employee engagement angle, the em where the people centred businesses where people care that the fact that their business is doing something about decarbonisation and in a kind of the workforce market as it is at the moment, that's valuable to a business. So I think that's the next stage of the data challenge on this is, is really people understanding the value in all this work that's being done. And it's not just we're all trying to get to net zero. There's actually a financial um, and business reason to be doing this as well. Fantastic. Thank you, Tash. Um, we're nearing the five minute mark, but Edwina, could I pose a, a question to you? So speaking about resilience and future proofing, um, how do you approach it? How are you future proofing and enhancing resilience across the portfolios to drive value? OK, I'll keep it, keep it tight. Um, so I guess I'd bucket it into two, two categories. The first is governance and transparency. Um, for example, on our climate, uh, dedicated climate strategy, uh, the investment committee has members of our e dedicated private investments ESG team um, as voting members. We also have a member of our impact management and measurement team as an, as, an, as an observer on that committee. That committee also has a dual mandate. They approve the financials, but they also improve the climate materiality case, and it has to pass both. Um, the other one I'd say is um, on the impact management, manage, measure, measurement and management part, you know, having a really rigorous um, and transparent um, framework there is critical, um, including like aligning how the impact itself, you know, is, um, can, is, can deliver the, um, you know, profits as well and linking that case is really important. 
Um, the second bucket is around the type of access to the proprietary tools and, and research that we have, um, and that is something that we share with um, investors, but also with directly also with portfolio companies. For example, we have uh, two climate um, science partnerships. One is with the Woodwell Climate Research Centre, which was started back in 2018. The other one is on physical risks. The other one is with the MIT Joint Programme on, on the transition risks. Just, for example, on the, with Woodwell, you know, on the data point that we've, has come across, you think the data is difficult to get in terms of emissions, try physical location data. It's not standards, it's not on the radar, but it actually can be material, especially where there's companies that have high you know, <coughs> assets that are critical to their operations, but also in vulnerable areas to, to wildfires, floods, sea level rises, etc. And so what we did with Woodwell is built a geospatial mapping tool, which we share with, with, with our portfolio companies, we share with investors. And from that, we've also built out an engagement program to actually help companies, both in public markets and private markets, say, OK, where it's material to your business, you need to understand the risks, but you also need to disclose those risks. And it's not about just the you know, asset location, it's production weighted. You know, because you could have, you know, five different operations, but if one is critical in terms of whether it's, in, you know, where the employees are located or the revenue streams, et cetera, production-based, that's, that's critical. Um, and then, uh, lastly, I'd, I'd sort of say is having the integration between the ESG and the impact and the deal teams is critical. Our ESG roadmaps are a collaboration across all three of those. And that's something that I guess is part of the culture, but also we bring in the expertise from our private our public markets uh, investors as well to inform that because a lot of that is around peer benchmarking as well, especially as, you know, as companies are preparing to pre-IPO. Fantastic. Thank you, Edwina. Um, we might just pause there. We're, we're near time, but I wonder if there's any questions from the audience. Um, if you do have a question, please just raise your hand and we'll get some microphones. Thank you, Jonathan. If you could just let us know where you're from and your question and, and potentially uh, who from the panel you'd like to answer your question, that'd be great. Yeah, thank, thanks, Julie. Uh, Peter C. Upper Curtis, Campbell Lutchens. Um, a, a question for the, for the panel, no one in, in particular, is just on scope three, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. It, it's obviously, um, you know, a, a, an indirect emission. It's, 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 you know, above the value chain, below the value chain with investee companies. It's not typically captured in net zero emission targets. Just wanted to get a sense of your view on how you assess that and if you've seen any progress in, in how that's been captured. I'm happy to yeah. jump in, Carl. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, so scope three, obviously looking at the value chain, and in the in the past, I think emissions were mostly limited to the direct emissions that you you know you you have a fleet and that's combusting fuel, or you have a facility that's doing something and that's creating those emissions. So why why are the emissions of your of your suppliers or your customers your problem? Um, I think that in a holistic risk management and opportunity sense. Um, understanding the impact of a change in the cost, especially if externalities are priced in, in those um, carbon emissions of your supplier. So let's say you have a logistics company providing um, transportation and, and, and services to you or delivering your product. Um, we've seen with the recent change in energy price what impact that can have on businesses when fuel prices go up. Um, so if there's a lot of carbon and emissions in your supply chain, um, that can be the most material um, risk in your, in your business. Um, a lot of the, the emissions are often transferred into scope three. There's been a massive shift actually of the percentage of emissions. And in a lot of these portfolio companies, more than 90% of the emissions are in fact in scope three. Um, because of a lot of more managed services that you buy these days, like uh, you don't run servers down in the basement, but you have those provided in the cloud, that essentially moves your scope two uh, electricity emissions into scope three, and you're dealing with your supplier like AWS to work out what the emissions from those are or how you're going to be impacted. Um, so it can be an absolutely material part of the, the puzzle. And certainly in a public context, um, scope three is required to be included in um, emissions reduction targets um, as they align to SBTI as well. So if um, there's particular frameworks and guidance that, that you can use there, but notwithstanding that's in a quite mature kind of public sense. Yeah, probably one last thing, sorry, I know I've had that Please. one, but, yes, but you know, I think just as a financial institution, one of the categories of scope three is category 15, which is investments. <clears throat> so that's in fact where all this financed emissions goes. Essentially, as a financial institution, you're investing, you're lending to these businesses, they're operating, 
and those emissions are then attributed to your scope three. Um, so a lot of the movement recently in financial institutions needing to work this out does have to do with the impending SEC disclosure rules and others where material scope three emissions will need to be reported for financial institutions. And, and that moves away from initial high level estimates to actual numbers that you can substantiate the same way you might with a financial um, number that you would report. Beautiful. Any other questions from the audience? Any questions online, Tim or Jonathan? No? Okay, fantastic. Um, we, we have a few moments until we close, so I wonder if I could just pose a, a, a general question now to all of our panellists. If you could leave us with one final piece of advice, uh, what would that be? Not sure who wants to go first, but... So, so I think if we look at the regulation that is happening around the world, this space that we're speaking about is going to get increasingly heavily regulated. Um, and, you know, um, what one can have as many opinions on that as we might, but, but this, I think, is the reality that we all face. So um, I think this is going to impact on two levels. Portfolio companies are going to need to have large amounts of data at their disposal to meet their disclosure requirements. Um, and, and that's going to be whether they're intending to go public or not. So even as private companies, they will need to have more disclosure requirements to meet the needs of their LPs, as Carl has just explained, who will in turn need to be um, disclosing their, uh, their carbon footprints, their net zero plans, etc. I think the second part is anyone managing um, a vehicle, selling a business into any uh, jurisdiction. We're already seeing this with Europe and the UK. There's going to be requirements around the labeling of where your fund um, or the approach your fund is taking with respect to these issues. So far more interrogation um, and to meet certain of the labelling requirements will require probably adjustments within what is done within an investment um, investment process. So even if you are not, like, you might not be in Europe today, but if you want to sell to European LPs, you are going to be, cap you are today captured in, in that regulation. Thank you, Suzanne. We have about a minute left, so. Sorry, <laughs> be very quick. Um, I think one thing that's often missed is that there's a lot of collaboration between entities that's required to make this work. So if nothing else, I'd say get started thinking about how you're engaging with your LPs, your portfolio companies, uh, what communication channels do you have set up, uh, and how that might need to change going forward to enable uh, this kind of disclosure. Fantastic. I had two things. One of them was collaboration. So I agree completely with that. We do lots of collaboration with our LPs, including we have an emissions reduction committee um, made up of our LPs that helps guide the baselining and development of net zero strategies across our portfolio. And that's been very, very valuable to both us and our LPs. Um, my second piece would be a little bit back to what I said before, is take an investment lens on this and don't start with it just from a compliance or a disclosure perspective. This is not just a legal and compliance issue. This is not just an IR or fundraising issue. Um, you really have to involve your investment teams in this and think about the investment risks to your portfolio. And if you come at it from that angle, you'll design something that's fit for purpose for your business and for your investors, your investors, because ultimately you are stewards of their capital. Um, and then the parts that require to be disclosed fall out of that, um, and the conversations with your investors fall out of that. Okay, 20 seconds. Um, definitely agree with the collaboration um, um, elements, uh, and also, you know, I think from my point of view, I'd say. Uh, it's just to start, um, get ahead of the regulation, it's coming. Um, but importantly, think of climate change, you know, to Tasha's point, as, an, as a you know, strategic risk to the business, um, because materiality is critical. Uh, and then don't, my last point is, don't stop with ambition. LPs, you know, yes, it's great to have the, you know, the net zero targets, but it really is about the outcomes as well. And that's where the scrutiny is, is pivoting to, is really understanding you know, what is the end, both at a portfolio level, but also portfolio companies, what is the net reduction in emissions that we're ultimately getting? Because that's what we need at the end of the day, and it's why we're doing this. Fantastic. Well, can we all please join me in thanking our panelists for a fascinating discussion, and thank you for your insights today. <laughs>